Good morning and welcome to my channel. Uh, this morning we're going to have a little chat about diagnosing watch problems, why a watch stops, or why a watch doesn't run well. And I'm going to be covering a lot of information here and I'm going to try to do it systematically. Now what I haven't done is run down all the steps in a list and said I'm going to cover all of this but what I'm going to do is try to do it in a logical order so you can see it. So if you want to contact me my contact is up there. It's jdwatchservice at gmail.com. If you want to leave any comments there or if you need some watch service being done, uh, I can uh, accommodate that. Just get a hold of me and we'll chat. Or if you've got any questions at all about watchmaking and tools, etc., uh, just contact me. I'm a little on the dark side right now with my video, but I don't want to screw up things. So I just want to leave it like that because it's a, it's a nice image of that beautiful 21 Joule Hamilton Lancaster uh, pocket watch and this pocket watch that you're looking at in the uh, right hand side is a watch that's in a salesman's case so the salesman's case is clear on the back so that the salesman could actually show the um, the uh, potential buyer the watch and have a look at uh, of all of the uh, gears mechanisms and jewels and gold and other things like this and this particular watch has has uh, gold settings as well so even the center wheel is, is gold so we've got gold settings here so one two center wheel is this is how you count the wheels so one is mainspring two is centered and three intermediate and then four is usually one two three four the seconds hand and then five would be the escapement and if you went kept going here I guess six is the is the uh, the balance so and you've got a beautiful movement here and we're just going to go through this and have a look at uh, what you would look at um, with this particular watch if it wasn't working so so follow along and i'll try to uh, do this in the, in the most simplest uh, way i can um, and i'm just going to pop in and out with squirrel moments uh, with things i've found uh, which might stop a watch and maybe how to rectify that all right what i have here is a beautiful book um, TM9-1575 War Department Technical Manual Ordnance Maintenance of Wristwatches Pocket Watches, Stop Watches and Clocks and this book is 6th of April 1945 War Department so it's from the school the Ryerson Institute of Technology School of Horology um, in Toronto Toronto Canada so this book is full of goodies I'm going to earmark it a bit here so I can flip through it just a bit. Um, it starts off with um, general maintenance of pocket watches. It just describes a uh, functional description of a watch. Um, there's an introduction to it and what is a watch and it's got the full diagram of the train of the rundown of the watch right there as you can see. So it's pretty impressive. Let's flip to another view so I can get a better view on this. There we go. Um, so it goes through everything. It goes through the uh, watch barrel assembly, disassembly of the watch barrel, the mainspring, the power, where it comes from. And again, it's a beautiful diagram of a, of a watch. A watch parts in typical movement, a rear view. So it goes through the whole watch and how this thing is put together mechanically. And all the names of everything, which is kind of critical. I kind of, in my videos, sometimes name things wrong. But uh, look at that. There's the crown wheel. And there's the ratchet wheel, and the ratchet wheel would be over the mainspring. So, and I often don't call that the ratchet wheel. I certainly don't call this the crown wheel, but it is the crown wheel. I just have to think of a crown. Um, so anyway, there's a beautiful uh, diagram of the watch for reference, right? And, and then it goes through um, your typical balance assembly. There's a typical balance assembly. And, and it's a really nice uh, depiction of the balance staff going all the way through. And the lower jewel here is what I replaced the other day. Um, and the upper jewel uh, w w that I cleaned the other day and how that rests in the uh, jewel itself. This is the upper uh, lower pivot of the balance staff and the upper pivot of the balance staff. And then the roller table. We'll get back to this a little bit later, I think, because it's going to be a good reference to, to uh, diagnose these kinds of problems. And then, of course, uh, you've got uh, the escapement here, the escape wheel, um, impulse jewels on the end, the, and the uh, lock and unlock, the pallet jewels. Then the uh, pallet 
arbor that goes all the way through. It's like a little staff going through. And the pallet fork, banking pins, critical. And then the roller jewel and the, the, the fork slot of the, of the balance fork. And there's the roller table. Um, and then they've got a, a different dimensional view here side on so you can see how this thing works. And, and there are issues that you can have in this area right here. So if you're making a new balance staff. And I did that a couple of videos ago. And then um, just flip through this really quickly here. Another view of the, of the uh, fork, you know, the, the uh, pallet fork and the escapement. And then the escapement description is here. And I'll just move this book around so we can see things winding and setting of the watch so these are basically uh, basic winding and setting mechanisms and then again the names of these things as the uh, the pinion here the the clutch wheel here the clutch setting wheel here and this is the wheel that uh, grinds around and then interacts with the uh, with d which is the minute wheel and then the hour wheel goes over the cannon pinion that's how that works there and then there's all kinds of different uh, clutch lever springs, setting springs, setting spring cams, etc., etc., that sort of thing. And uh, and it gets into some more details about watch winding and the movement over on this side here. So it just basically says how to how does that work when you rotate this, and then when you pull pull this out like this, this goes this way, and then, and it engages these wheels for setting the, uh, the setting right time on the watch. And when you push it in. It, it engages, it disengages these wheels for actually winding the watch. So, so a little more detail on that and then what type of jewels that you have and stuff like that. But getting into I guess, general maintenance and also this, this is a really uh, cool book because it also gives you a rundown of all of the tools that you might want to uh, use or collect um, in doing watch, watch repair. I believe I showed you this in yesterday's video when I was uh, working on that that old Elgin watch um, and I had a, uh, a demagnetizer that scares me because it's got a button on it and I remember wearing a giant glove when I first bought this and turned it on thinking I'm going to get electrocuted. This is a mainspring winder here and um, I have two of these I think and uh, but I don't use them. I do. I put the mainsprings in by hand. I find it a lot easier and I think that the the pros actually used to do that all the time. Uh, this here is for putting in gaskets and it's totally useless. I have one of these uh, for, for putting in uh, crystals rather. It's for putting in crystal, crystals, crystal press. It's useless. But get yourself a good crystal press. Don't, don't waste your money on that. And there's some other tools in here that are of use. Um, and this also lists all the tools here in the book and what they're for and blah blah yada yada yada. And then you've got the next page here and in this page here Basically, it gives you all the fifth echelon tools. So the way the military works is there's maintenance echelons. So I think this is the probably the second line. This would be a back shop repair tools, right? So probably the fourth echelon. Fifth echelon is when you're getting into some serious watch work here. Um, I don't think there's a sixth echelon here, but watch repair senior tool set so this is a senior it's not spanish for senor it's senior so this is a tool set that a uh, more advanced watchmaker would have um, i've got there's a caliper here that i've shown how to use um, there's uh this is this is for adjusting the, uh, the the true of the balance itself i've done a video on that and again the uh, very dangerous uh and demagnetizer um, i actually have i think i've got one of these right here this is uh, this tool right here, I believe. Um, and then it's got uh, pin vices. And, are there pin vices in here? Yeah, I've got one of these as well for removing the hands. And I've got a block. I've got pretty much all this stuff in here. And then you go into the staking sets and stuff like that. And you get, and again, got this stuff, senior tool set, got all this. Uh, yeah, there's no nothing here that I don't have, I don't think. Um, pin vices. I even have this little device here, X, which is a vice pin double and chuck. And then it shows you a picture of the watchmaker's table, and that's from the 40s. So my table does not look like that right now. And um, and then we go into cleaning machines. I clean by hand, so I don't use one of these cleaning machines. Although someday I'd like to have a nice cleaning machine, but they're a bit of a pain. We'll we'll wait. And of course I've. And a lot of lathe work. This is a peerless lathe. 
and I do believe they made a lot of peerless, uh, peerless lays uh, for the war effort. And when the soldiers came back from from uh, the war, they would train them on how to make how to be watchmakers and how to make parts and stuff. And they used a the peerless lay. So I actually have one of these old vintage pedals as well, but I use a a, diff a dentist uh, motor pedal, which is nice. I've got a set of cross slides and. And you've got to all have all this stuff and a chuck, basically, for working on crowns and all kinds of things. So you can chuck up a piece of brass or chuck up a part and work on it. Um, so that's all, all good. Um, we're going to finally get to where there's timing machines that I don't use this kind of a timing machine. I use software timing machines, um, but I'm sure back in the day it worked. And then it has general maintenance. That is not a military guy. There's no soldier named general maintenance, by the way. So this is uh, the general maintenance on winding and dampness and handling of parts and replacement of parts and yada 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 yada, right? So, um, and of course, if you're in the military and you got to keep some time, uh, you don't want to not be the time to be set because when you're ready to go off in the military, you uh, synchronize your watches, uh, you jump up and down so nothing rattles, and you put camouflage on your face. So, and then some cleaning and lubrication information in this book. And then, what do we got here? Lubrication, blah, 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 the oil, oil train jewels, pallet stones, all of this stuff is in here. Now, troubleshooting. So, so here it uh, goes through each one of the uh, possible reasons why a watch might stop, right? So, and it's saying that, um, you know, the, the watch could stop if the hands are catching, for example or the hands are touching the crystal. I've had that happen a few times on watches. So, um, and it, it tells you what to do to determine whether the hands are setting or, or touching basically. So, and I've had this, this problem when I'm setting a watch. Let me just grab a watch here really quickly. Um, when I'm working on a pocket watch like this beautiful Hamilton pocket watch, and I, I will put the hands back on the watch um, this is after maintenance, of course, because before maintenance you may not have this problem. And this is a lever set watch. So I'd pull this out like that, and then I'd turn the hands, and I'd look at this thing, the, the watch hands in this position here. So I'd take the, the watch and look at it like this, and as I wound this by, I could act, see if these hands are clearing each other. And if you can see here, they're clearing, which is not a problem. Um, I just have to cut these fingernails here, eh? but I used these thumbnails the other day to put that mainspring back in, So, but I should trim them down. So that's one thing as well. When the second hand comes around, as it's doing right now, you can see whether this, the, the hour hand will interfere with that second hand. And I've had the situation where my hour hand was coming around like this, and right at this moment when the tip of the hour hand touches the tip of the second hand, the darn watch stopped on me. I was like, okay, I couldn't find out, figure out why this watch was stopping, and that that that's what it was. The hour hand was way too um, way too low, uh, and and this the seconds hand actually was up a little bit here. So I had to adjust, take the second hand off, and adjust it down just a bit so it wouldn't touch the face, but it would be um, low enough to to go underneath the hour hand. So things like that can happen. So. If, uh, and, and it doesn't describe all of this here, but it does say, you know, make sure that they're not rubbing and they're not rubbing on the dial uh, and they're not rubbing against the crystal. So I've also had the situation with the crystal where I put the um, crystal back on uh, and just screw that back on. This one here is pretty easy, I think. I'm going to say it's easy to screw back on until I actually do it and then you'll watch me for 20 minutes trying to screw this back on. Of course, I had the lever out. It doesn't help. There we go. So if you screw that back on and the crystal, <clears throat> the crystal is is uh, too low. It's a domed crystal, but it's not. There's not enough room between the um, the minute hand and the crystal. Then this is going to rub against the the crystal itself, and then you've got then you've got to lower this or bend the end down just a bit so it doesn't rub, or get a new crystal because it's the wrong crystal. But if the watch is is not working, it's been uh, jogged around a little. Uh, more than likely the minute hand might have moved out of place rather than the other hands. So so this book is, is saying some of that, right? 
Um, it's also talking about the dial being loose or out of position, right? And if the dial feet are broken, uh, you may have an issue there and the dial just isn't where it should be. And that's going to cause all kinds of issues with the watch if the dial feet are broken and the dial lifts up a bit and then you're going to have the dial, the dial itself, um, the face of the watch I call it, but the dial itself touching the hour hand and then causing the watch to stop. So, and then it goes into broken broken wheels and on teeth. Let me just move this out of the way or maybe move this around like this. Um, put this on top. I need more real estate on my desk here. Uh, broken or bent hour wheel, teeth, pipe, blah, blah, blah. Uh, minute wheel broken, pinion leaves. But what I'm going to do here just to start off with is I'm going to tell you what I do when I first get a watch and I diagnose it so we don't have to go through this book. This book, I'll flip through it after, but there's a lot of information on what can go wrong with a watch um, and we'll go through a little bit more detail but the basic diagnostics I'm going to get into in a second here. Well the first thing I do when I get a pocket watch is I see whether the darn thing will wind properly um, and I just move it back a bit and that's the click spring moving back there and then I just give it a little bit of a wind. I wound this one up this morning so if it's winding nicely and there's no catching going on. I know those gears are in place and the screws are in tight, right? So, and there's the back of it there. So if it's winding like that, and you can see the click spring here, um, the click, the click, I should get the uh, parts of the watch out again, right? So the click, and it's, there's the crown wheel, um, and it's engaging here, and you can see this winding here. Um, it's going through the crown to the stem to the crown wheel, and then it's winding the uh, mainspring that's under the, under the, hold on, I get my reference manual out here, under the, 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 the ratchet wheel. There you go. I'll leave this page open. There we go. So, turn this around for a second. Oh my God. There we go. There we go. That's a little bit better. There we go. Well, there's a little bit the lighting's off a bit but what the heck right so there's a ratchet wheel so when i get this i look at that and i determine whether i've got a it's connecting properly and it's it's doing that so it's winding properly i also look to see if the screws here are tight um, usually the screws on the crown wheel are reverse um, depending on the configuration of this wheel but they're they're usually reverse i think when the wheels on uh on when the the uh, ratchet wheel is on this side this ends up being reverse and if it's on the other side it's not reverse but again correct me if i'm wrong but when i remove it i test it very carefully so i don't ruin anything here so so i just make sure that the watch winds properly right and then when i set the watch like as in this case here i'm really i can't ex i can't really look at the the works underneath here so the setting mechanisms but when i set the watch i actually uh let me just wind this back a bit there we go and pull this out so this is a lever set watch so this will engage a mechanism because it's a railroad grade watch and when i set the watch i look for how smooth it's setting right does that feel like it's smooth um, because there's gears that are moving around here to set this watch so when i'm setting it other than what i described earlier in the hands see if i can find this in the book right let me get to this part of the book that might describe how this works there we go so i'll just leave it like this for now so when i set this watch i'm turning i'm turning the pinion here right and this is this is ends up turning uh, this gear here which is a setting wheel and then it turns the minute wheel and it turns the hour wheel which is over the cannon pinion so if this if these wheels are in good condition this should all set nice and smoothly um, when i repair a watch uh, i usually put a dab of oil right here on the uh, right inside of of the pinion right here so on the the post that's on the on the uh, this watch movement uh, the, the 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 upper plate so i put the uh, a little bit of oil on that and i usually i i sometimes do, do a dab of oil on this too just to make it nice and smooth um and this b which is the the clutch wheel here engages the uh, setting wheel here so if all this stuff is running smoothly 
then there's no issue at all and it'll set perfectly. But if you've got screws that are loose at all, like if this screw is loose here and this comes out, then this then the uh, then the clutch wheel won't move forward. Uh, when you pull the stem out, this doesn't move forward, and that could cause it not to catch properly, and you might feel a little bit of grinding going on. If there is grinding going on, don't force the parts, because if you force the parts, you're going to lose a tooth. I replaced one of these wheels the, uh, the other day on a watch where two of the teeth were broken because the person obviously tried to turn it, didn't work, and when you turn it, it doesn't work. You try to turn it again, it could skip the, skip the tooth and actually work, then go around once, and then seem like it's stuck again and then not work. So that's usually a symptom of, of the uh, of the setting wheel being broken or a tooth broken on the setting wheel. So um, also if the uh, if you have a, uh, the leaf leaf spring or the, uh, the you, you put a little metal leaf on top of this uh, wheel here and it's bent in a U shaped and the face of the watch pushes down on this which pushes down the leaf pushes down on the hour wheel keeping the hour down so that the teeth of the hour wheel engage the pinion teeth of the minute wheel and if you're missing that leaf which I've missed which I've seen before that they're actually missing on here uh, then then the wheel could ride up a bit and not catch the pinion here so and you can you can actually feel it so so my recommendation is you wind it like this and then you turn it upside down like this and you wind it like this and if you turn it upside down and wind it and and it seems to be catching that means there the leaf spring is not in here or the leaf is not in here um, and that could cause this to uh, just fall sort of down and towards the face of the uh, the face of the watch and then these won't catch properly so you can test it that way as well um, but if everything is wor in working condition uh, if you pull this, if you pull the crown out, in this case it's a lever set, so you're not pulling the crown out. So there's a lever in here that allows you to set the watch, and it looks a bit different than this mechanism. But if you pull the crown in, in your typical pocket watch, um, and and for some reason it won't set, um, there might be a problem with the crown stem mechanism in there as well. So so you've got to check all of that, uh, but you can get a feel for whether it's setting and or not setting. And if there's broken teeth, then of course you're going to have to replace that that part. Um, very hard to replace a tooth on a small wheel like that. So the replacing a tooth on the setting wheel is, is a uh, very, very difficult job. So that's the first thing I look at. Um, and when I'm looking at the watch here, let me flip back to my cheat sheet here so I can have a look at this. Um, there we go. So, so that's the basic there. And then I'm looking at the various wheels that we have here. So this is the center wheel. And I call that the uh, second wheel because the first wheel is the mainspring, actually. So the center wheel, usually you don't have problems with the center wheel. The only problem I've seen with the center wheel in the past, if it's slightly bent at all, and your watch is a very tightly fit in movement, um, then the mainspring or the balance that's rotating could rub against the uh, center wheel if the wheel's down a bit. So if it's just down a bit. And it could be down a bit from a worn jewel, maybe in the in the wheel. Uh, not often that problem, though. Um, it could be just a maintenance issue that some someone who was doing maintenance on the wheel just rested her hand on it or something while they were cleaning it, and it bent the wheel down. So I've seen that actually before. So, so the 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 train of wheels here um, going through when you get when you get the mainspring giving power here to the center wheel. There could also be problems with the teeth. There could also be obstructions in the teeth, like a piece of dirt that might be in one of the teeth, like between one of the teeth. So it's when it's making contact with either the mainspring, right, or the third wheel here, the intermediate wheel. Uh, is that what they call it here? Let's see if I can get this right. Third wheel. Yeah, they just call it the third wheel. I call it the intermediate wheel. This is the fourth wheel, and the fourth wheel is actually the wheel that uh, where the second hand comes through. So, so I've seen it where where this will go. You know where the hour wheel will will fling around once, right? Or the center wheel will come around once, right? And it'll touch. Uh, it'll be. It'll stop because when it gets to to the mainspring, um, it just can't get through because the two teeth, the teeth underneath the mainspring, kind of uh, get get caught up uh, with the tooth of the uh, of the center wheel. So that that can cause the problem, uh, which is not good. So. So that is an issue. Um, 
And I think I got that right. Did I get that right? I think I made one mistake here. I think I did make one mistake. I Just uh, to go back again, I'm looking at the, the center pinion. So the center wheel pinion is engaging the teeth of the, of the, uh, of the mainspring barrel, right? So that's the mainspring barrel here. And that's the teeth here. So what I'm saying is that there's a problem with the center pinion with dirt in there, and that could cause that to stop. Not usually because there's so much power coming from the mainspring that it might just grind through that wheel there. But and if you go one more over and, and, ref and just sort of disregard what I had said previously, if there's a tooth issue on the center wheel, then that tooth could come in contact with this, with this pinion here on the third wheel and, and that actually could stop the watch. So, and I've seen that before with a broken tooth. And now you can replace a tooth actually on a center wheel because the center wheel is so big. There's, uh, there's books that I have that show actually how to, how to put in a brand new tooth into that wheel. So it's kind of cool. Anyway, so that's, that's the train as I go down. And of course, same thing for the next wheel. If you look at the uh, third wheel, right? Or the intermediate wheel. This wheel again is engaging the pinion of the fourth wheel, which is where your second hand comes through. So your second hand actually is the fourth wheel here in this situation. So it's it's coming through like this, one, two, three, four, that's your second hand. And if that wheel, if this, there's a tooth problem here, then this tooth will show itself by touching the pinion, the gear, the, the leaves as they call them, or leaves of the pinion on the, uh, on the fourth wheel. And that could stop the watch as well. So, and as I go down another one, I'm looking at the fourth wheel, touching the escapement pinion. And again, if there's a tooth problem here, I can see that stopping. I've also seen dirt, uh, dirt within the escapement pinion and just gummed up from oil or dirt or dust or something. And that will stop the watch. I've seen it. It's a very light, light pinion. This thing just spins like crazy. Um, and that'll stop the watch as well. And as you go down, and that, that dirt in there could stop the watch too. And I'm not even talking jewels yet. And if you get down to this position here, um, and you're looking at the, uh, at the uh, escapement going around, and you've got the uh, pallet fork, which is going back and forth, tick, 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 like this. And it's locking and releasing as it goes by. If there's anything wrong with the position of the jewels on the pallet fork, or, and or if they're loose, then you're gonna you're, you're you're gonna stop the watch for sure and as I go down again even further um, if there's any problem with the feet here on the escapement <coughs> which is not very common but there could be dirt on here and that's gonna stop the watch as well so I think it's time for me to have a little drink of my coffee because I'm starting to cough all right I'm back I'm back back in black so moving moving through again so you've got your pallet fork here and then when you get into the escapement, there's all kinds of, or the uh, balance, and the balance, the balance, the balance uh, staff, the, uh, the hairspring, uh, the, the screws, the balance screws. Um, <laughs> there, there's all kinds of stuff that can happen here. But let's just say, okay, when I diagnose the watch, here's what I do. I wind the watch up, and if it works, it works. If it stops, it could be a, a number of things that could cause it to stop. So I work from the power um, inward. So it's just like my pappy used to say, when you're using working on electronics, always go from the power inward and see what happens. Um, when I'm repairing a watch, I'll put all of this together. So I'll put the, the mainspring and all of the plates in like that. But if I'm a little concerned about the, the power coming to the, to the escapement, what I'll do is I'll take out the balance to balance complete and I'll take out the balance, the uh, pallet fork as well. And then I'll do what they call run, run their train, right? So I'm r running a r the wheel train and you just wind it a bit and the train goes zzzz, and it runs down. So the escapement just spins because you're, you're removing the pallet fork from that and you just wind it ever so slightly and it just, re it releases the power uh, right into the last wheel here, which is the escape wheel and it just spins. So you can see whether it's spinning uh, really nicely and you let it spin down as it slows down. It should spin at a constant kind of, not a constant velocity, I'd say, because it's gonna, it's gonna decelerate just a bit as the power from the, uh, the mainspring sort of lets down, um, but it'll be smooth. You'll see a smooth deceleration until it stops. It won't be a sudden stop. So you can, you can test and see if there's issues 
uh, with with the uh, with these wheels and if there's gum in there and everything right so but if the watch stops you're going to be disassembling it and cleaning it anyway so so the first thing you're doing if the watch stops is you're not going to go jump in there and say whoa the watch stopped I wonder what's wrong um, and start farting with it right the, the if the watch stops and it hasn't been cleaned in a while or even if it has been cleaned in a while the best thing to do is to disassemble the watch and then and then when you clean it and reassemble it run the train and see if you get a smooth smooth action from the mainspring all the way through the train as well when you're of course cleaning the watch you can examine all the pinions you can examine the, the teeth the leaves and the pinions and you can examine the teeth the wheels and the teeth and the wheels to make sure that they're perfect and there's no issue and you can examine all of the pivots on each one of these wheels to make sure there's there's no there isn't a bent pivot and I'm not even talking about the escape the uh, balance complete yet so you examine each one of these pivots um, and if there's an issue with any of these pivots uh, you're likely gonna have to re-pivot the wheel or get a brand new wheel there's no there's no other choice right the other thing is when I look at a watch too um, sometimes even before I disassemble it I'll look very carefully at each one of these jewels because you can see the pivot popping through the jewel and you can tell whether there's a problem with the jewel itself and whether it might be cracked or not. Um, but when you disassemble the watch, for sure, you look at the jewel, the ju each individual jewel is under high magnification. Um, I use a stereo microscope to do that so I can actually see the uh, see each one of these jewels and, and tell whether there's an issue with the jewel or not, and whether it's cracked or not. So it's kind of important to do that. Um, and then, of course, if there's a problem with the jewel, you're going to need to replace the jewel. And I've made a video, I think, two days ago on that, uh, where I replaced the uh, the fourth wheel jewel, which would have been the jewel, the upper, I think it was the upper jewel, on, on a pocket watch. And it was, uh, I think it was this watch that I'm working on right now that's running exceptionally well. That's this watch here that I'm testing and going to deliver back in a short period of time. So let me just open this up. This is a gorgeous, gorgeous Elgin pocket watch. It's pretty old. Um, so this, in this watch here, um, it had issues, and it turned out that the uh, this jewel here needed to be replaced. So this was the jewel for the uh, for the escapement, I believe. Yeah, this was the escapement jewel that I needed to replace here. So it wasn't the uh, it wasn't the fourth wheel. So one, two, three, four here was fine. The escapement needed to be replaced. And there's there was no uh, there's just a bushing here. There's no jewel for the center wheel for this watch. And I replace the jewel on this watch. Um, and I replace the lower jewel for the uh, for the balance. So the balance staff pivot going through the lower jewel. And the lower jewel wasn't cracked. It was just worn. So, and let me just draw a little picture for you here, because when you're looking at uh, diagnosing watch issues, um, oh by the way, my wife loves it when I draw these little pictures. So. So if I have a jewel, this is my jewel here. Say I got a jewel here, and there's the jewel hole. And I say I've got a couple of conditions here. When I look down um, with uh, with my uh, stereo microscope at the jewel, and I see the jewel has a crack in it like that. And usually it's cracked on both sides because the crack here will cause stress in the overall uh, jewel and cause it to uh, crack on the other side. So this jewel hole might look like it's perfect but if you zoomed in on the jewel hole you'd see that one side would be like this right and the other side would be just slightly offset i'm just exaggerating it here like that and that offset of the jewel hole because you can't you can have a jewel in here but it won't always be absolutely perfect when it's in the setting so it's going <clears> to <throat> allow that to go sideways a bit <clears throat> talking a lot you can lose your voice and that causes friction here and here at these two points and <clears throat> and that friction when the pivot goes through like this that friction will grind away at the pivot and wear the pivot out so then you've got you're going to have the pivot of the wheel break uh, it's, it's sitting in this jewel hole so that's not good <clears throat> and the other situation that I had the other day I'll draw this again I may have to have another drink of my coffee is the jewel hole it was the lower jewel for the uh, for the uh, the balance complete so it was a lower jewel so the balance staff would go pivot lower pivot would go through there um, 
<clears throat> and the upper the upper is this part and the lower is on the face believe it or not it's backwards so this jewel looked perfect under a microscope except when i zoomed in it did have a little bit of a raggedy look but i thought it was dirt so it was my fault um, i even apologized on the video but it looked like that so there was a bit of raggedy on there and i think that one of the raggedies had, was out a little bit so it was a little bit out but you if you're looking at that through your typical lens like this, you're pro you're not going to see that. So you, you need to get deep and dirty. Uh, and when you look at these, and I used to look at it with a lens that looked like this, which was a times, this is a times, it's on times 15 now, but I could get into times 20 with this. And these are like 10 bucks on AliExpress. And this would get me close enough to have a look, but then I, then I noticed that my, getting a stereo microscope or a microscope of any type and you can really look at it so so in this situation either of these two situations that's going to cause friction on the wheel um, and that's going to stop that wheel so so any one of these any one of these wheels here could have a problem where they're jeweled and um, and that's going to cause friction it's going to cause that to to uh, to stop the watch or break the pivot or wear the pivot down so it's not riding smooth so if the pivot is worn down or the jewel is broken, also, when you run the train on the watch, it's not going to run smoothly, and you'll see that right away. Now, in another yesterday's video where I was, uh, the final video for the 15 jeweled, uh, for this watch actually here, uh, what I did was I took out, the, the, the balance complete was removed from the watch, so when I put all this together and I put a new, new balance spring in here, uh, in the mainspring, new mainspring, actually, not a balance spring, but a new mainspring in here. Um, and I just put that all in here without the balance in here. Um, and then you just touch the watch, the uh, pallet fork. Let's see if I can find my pallet fork picture here. Uh, there it is there. So you just tap the pallet fork without this in here, without the roller table and the, and the impulse jewel. I call it roller jewel, but impulse jewel. Um, you tap that and it snaps over to the to one side and of course this releases here and then you touch it and it snaps over to the other side uh, you know you've got power on that pallet fork on the slot that's going to push that impulse jewel because it's snapping over and that's working really well so so let me just get into this for a second seeing that I'm, I'm in this picture anyway so as I go through my my diagnosis um, I'm, I'm ensuring that this the watch uh, the setting mechanisms are working. I'm ensuring that there's power getting to the mainspring through the the crown to the stem uh, to the to the crown wheel, um, and then to whatever the hell this wheel's called <laughs> to the <laughs> ratchet wheel. I think I need to memorize this. I don't teach watch repair. I just do watch repair. So, so to the ratchet wheel, you make sure that these screws are down because I've repaired a watch before and I forgot to tighten it and then, then it'll ride up a bit and if it rides up a bit then you get problem with the, with the teeth uh, marrying up at the right right position the right level so make sure all of that is good in the watch um, that usually will not have a problem with the watch unless there's poor workmanship I did repair a watch that was a Tissot watch it was a watch watch um, should have watch watches here so there's an old this is an old Waltham watch that's beautiful. And I, I did a video on repairing this old Waltham watch here. And and I did a, and it, when I received this Tissot watch from this gentleman, uh, there was a, a loose, you know how say someone's got a loose screw? So this thing actually had a loose screw. And the loose screw got caught underneath the balance. And, and I can't remember which screw it was, but I believe it was one of the uh, screws for one of these plates and it, it was loose and it got stuck in there and for some reason the watch would work then it wouldn't work and the thing was just rattling around inside so that does happen and you can get loose screws from from uh, improper maintenance of watch that the watch screws are not tightened properly and they'll come out right so and that's sometimes it's just forgetting to do it and as you've seen when i'm repairing a pocket watch um, i'll put the screws in the plate for example here and I won't screw them down tight until I know those pivots are poking through the jewels. Otherwise, I'm going to have, I'm going to, I'm going to take the pivot on one of these wheels and bend it. So I, I do that first, make sure everything works. Then I tighten the screws down. But if I forget to tighten the screws down, I put it all together. The thing seems to work. There's no issues. But over time, that'll rattle itself loose and and could come out. And then then you've got this loose screw around. Or if it comes loose, 
the plate will ride up and the pivot will come out of the jewel and then everything will go everything will go to hell in a handbasket. As I said, there was a person called Helena Handbasket. I think my wife has a friend called Helena Handbasket. Anyway, back to this here. So you can do the snap test before you put the escapement back in the watch to make sure that works. So again, if the watch stops, it could be, like I said earlier, it could be the jewels here are, lo are, are loose on the pallet fork, or it could be um, the, the problem with the, the uh, impulse face, as they call it, the proper name on the escapement wheel. I call them the feet because they look like little feet. Um, and when I put the uh, this back in the watch, I always, if, whether it's upside down or the other way around, because all the watches kind of be are a little bit different, but I always go feet right, feet left, because I know which way they're leaning towards the right or the left when I put it back. So that could be the problem there. And as I dig deeper into the watch and look at, at the issues I might have here, um, I could have a problem with the banking pin position. It might be too tight, which is causes the pallet fork not to snap back, and the, and the and the uh, actually the pallet fork jewel not to release and catch on the other side. So that could, the the position of these banking pins could be an issue. Usually they're not because the uh, in the old pocket watches they're kind of friction fit in there, and there's a little sc a screw slot in the top, and then you can move it left and right and. I've, I have adjusted these before, but you've got to go get some other books over on the other side to learn how to adjust that properly. So, so and, in a, and then as I go forward th through here, one of the problems I found on a watch a couple of months ago was that the roller jewel was actually loose. So the roller jewel, if I slide down to this diagram, da -da -da -da, I'm looking at this, this view, of, which is a side view of the whole thing, right? And if, as this works here, the mouth or the slot of the pallet fork here is catching that roller jewel and the jewel is round on one side and flat as it enters and that was loose and it was causing some erratic motion on the watch and I could see that on my e-timer because I could see the when it's going tick 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 and you get the signals on your timer you can see that it's not a normal signal coming through so that was a loose loose roller jewel and I actually had to shellac the jewel back in so now, back to that, this is an interesting guard pin thing here too. So the other problem that you could have, wouldn't be common for a watch to stop all of a sudden if the guard pin is a problem. But what, what happens is that the jewels on the, the upper and lower uh, balance fork, or sorry, the balance staff jewels upper and lower could be bent or worn. So if this jewel is bent in a certain way, or the, sorry, the pivot is bent in a certain way, I said the jewel could be bent. Just don't listen to me, okay? So if the pivot is bent in a certain way, uh, due to impact or whatever, but the jewel is fine, then this balance might be moving a little bit left or right as it swings around into the oval, right, of the jewel, the jewel hole, which could cause this this uh, this uh, roller jewel to be out of position as it enters the uh, the slot of the pallet fork, right? So so you have to have a uh, make sure that the jewel that's on the roller table is actually firm and all you do is you take your tweezers and you grab it and you move it just a little bit and if it's moving then you got a problem then you've got to shellac that back in and that's a whole other lecture I've got some videos on that as well the other thing is that you could have a, a problem with the guard pin it could be damaged it could be broken something could be wrong with that and that guard pin goes into the uh, this is a, a lower guard so this is a, a dual table roller table here and the lower table actually just stakes back on here and this guard pin might not enter this uh, correctly so that could be another issue um, I made a balance staff for a gentleman the other day uh, and I'm gonna grab this first all right I'm not gonna put this down because it's basically like this and I rest it like this but this watch here um, had a problem with the upper jewel so there was an issue that the upper jewel was just not in the right place. So let me wind this for a second. There we go, just hang on. And there we got some action there. And there we go, so the watch is working now. Um, and this is a bench key, by the way. So this is a beautiful 21 jewel a BW Raymond watch. Uh, the face needs a little bit of cleaning, but I got this thing running really well. Um, and it needed a new jewel here and I made the balance staff for this on my lathe so when I put this balance staff together if I look at it sideways here um, it's not too bad I got a little tiny bit of a sh very basic shake here but I also had to straighten the balance out as well 
because the balance wasn't true to flat on this watch. So in this case here, um, I had a problem down here because I had shaved um, a bit too much material off the lower balance, I think, or the lower pivot, and causing the whole thing to ride down. And when this rode down, then the pallet fork was actually touching the uh, the roller table as it went through. So that was a, that was an issue. So and I had to fix that. Um, anyway, I had to adjust it. I did have more real estate to deal with, so I was able to fix that no problem. Um, and it's, as you can see, it's running really well now. I'm going to deliver it this next week um, to the gentleman in England. So this was a, a very good repair. Um, and he asked me to make a balance staff. Actually, he asked me to fit a balance staff in there. Um, but the balance staff he gave me was the wrong one. So I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll just make a balance staff. So I made one for him, um, and away we go. So the watch is ticking away. Uh, the face needs a bit of cleaning, but that's what the problem was. So it was actually touching here. So you have to make sure all of this works properly. I looked through the side of the watch and very carefully with my thumb, moved the balance and watched the balance as it, uh, the impulse jewel as it went through the, the actual slot in the fork. And I could see whether that, that was actually making proper contact or not, and it wasn't. It was rubbing there, so that was an issue. So, so I repaired that um, and got it working again, and that's that watch there. So let's continue. So now moving up to the typical balance assembly, as it calls it. There are the parts of the balance. I get my little tweezer pointers here. So a few things I've found uh, in the past. I can't. I'm not sure if I can show you it on this, but. A few things I've found in the past um, when I've either made a balance staff um, or, or the problems you can have with a balance staff that's, that the balance is affixed to or staked onto. Uh, the first problem is that the pivots are, are worn, they're crooked, they're bent, they're whatever. Usually if you have a bent pivot on here, you can't straighten that out. There are techniques to straighten it out. There are tools, even I have the tools that allow you to straighten that out and you might be able to do it once. You definitely can't do it twice because it'll, it'll break the second time. Um, but but usually if you've got a bent balance staff, it's pretty it's toast, and you want to replace the the balance. If the pivot is bent on the end, it's toast. Um, and sometimes, as I said before, a ragged jewel or a cracked jewel in the top here will wear that pivot out in the top here, and then and then you basically have to replace the balance staff. And I've got I've made some videos on how to do that. Um, the this is a sort of side view of the balance here and these are the screws here for the you have to make sure that the the, the balance is poised properly um, and there's a poising tool that you use it's like a, it's like a when you're uh, put your tire under the thing to make sure the weights are on the right side of the tire that's pretty much all you're doing except you're doing it with a balance so and there's a books written on that I've done this before um, but there's screws that are for that are used for temperature control. There's screws that are used for actually poising the balance properly. Um, and there's tools that are used. Let me see if I can find the, the the senior bench tools for poising balances or whatever it's called. Hopefully I didn't get the term wrong. You guys will criticize me. I think. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? It's not there, it's not there. So maybe it's under advanced, advanced tools. I saw it earlier. There it is, H. So H is called a tool for poising. Look at that. Right. Tool for poising. So that's a poising tool there, and that's a view from the uh, the top. And the, the this is this is these are made uh, of ruby. And I've showed you these, I think, with my video on small tools. And you're placing that sideways like this, or not up and down, but sideways on this, and you're puffing air on it, and you're seeing whether it stops at the at the same place each time, which means there's more weight on that side, and you got to deal with it. So, so that's that's an issue that you might deal with. But a watch stopping might be one of these screws uh, coming out of the watch and actually coming out a bit. I've seen that before. Um, it missing the screw because the weight's off, but the screw coming out and being jammed in here somewhere. Um, but when you're, as I said earlier, when you're, when you've got a bent pivot on here, um, and because of an impact it might have had, uh, and usually only because of an impact that the watch has had, someone's dropped it and the whole thing goes like that. And these pivots are 0.12 to 0.09 
uh, millimeters uh, in diameter. So they're pretty small. It doesn't take much. They're just slightly bigger than a human hair, I think. And I use blued steel. Um, so if you've got that issue, then the watch could stop. The jewel, replacing the jewel will, will uh, if your pivots are fine and your jewels are cracked, as I said before, the watch could stop. If your cap jewel that's on here um, has is cracked, that could definitely stop the watch because the pivot is actually touching the cap jewel, and that's where your oil is for this. So it's just ever so slightly touching the uh, cap jewel. So, so you're looking at side shake, which is the actual movement of this pivot inside the jewel hole, or end shake, which is the movement up and down touching this cap jewel. So you may have uh, too much end shake, which could actually crack that jewel if there's a shock, or too much side shake, which could crack, crack the jewel or bend the pivot if there's a shock in that direction. So, so if it's dirty and there's like 30 years of, of gunk in here, that's also going to slow the slow the watch down, slow the the uh, balance down as it spins. It probably wouldn't stop the watch though. It probably would just make it perform poorly. It wouldn't. The amplitude wouldn't be the same. And the amplitude is sort of, if you look at a watch at any point and it swings around like this um, and it goes 360 degrees and then comes back 360 degrees, the amplitude is half of 360 degrees of that. So it's not twice. So I like to get the watches, the swing, I call it the swing on the balance. I like to get the swing on the balance at least 360 degrees um, or more. So if I can get another 90 degrees out of that, it's perfect. And I managed to do that the other day with the watch I just showed you. So, so that's the swing. So, so that could slow the watch down or it could stop the watch if you've got a bent uh, pivot on here. And that's going to be something you diagnose after you've actually gone and after you've run the train on the watch and made sure that all of this works properly without the balance in there, then, then and you know it works properly, then you can crack open the balance and have a look at that. So the other thing I find happens, you get the, the watch out in, in plain view here, is, and maybe there's another picture I can use, just hang on a second, see if I can use another picture on this. See if I can find another photo. I'm hoping there's another photo. It would be nice if there's another photo. Let me just pause for a second. All right, I think I'm going to have to draw yet another picture. So the other thing that could happen, right, is magnetism of the watch. Now, when you're looking at the major wheels from the mainspring all the way through to the center, uh, so one, two, the intermediate wheel, the seconds uh, wheel, and then the escapement, usually magnetism is not going to cause an issue because these wheels are pretty big and you have to have a uh, rare earth magnet to stop stuff. But I'll tell you where magnetism becomes a problem is with the hairspring. So let's talk hairsprings for a second. So hairsprings are my funnest topic. There's a bad English funnest, okay? So hairsprings are a pain in the Batinsky. As anybody who's wa worked on watches knows that cleaning the watch is fun. Um, replacing stuff could be fun. Uh, the minute you get into a hairspring problems, the fun turns into non-fun. So, so when you've got a watch like this, if I look at the hairspring and how this works, um, see if I can do this here. So this is the balance uh, sideways, right from the side. And if you're looking at the balance here, right, then inside of this balance is the hairspring. And here's the hairspring. They depict it this way. There's the hairspring coming around there. And the hairspring is a circular spring that is attached to the collet. This is the collet, like a donut, and it's staked on, right? So the, the balance itself is staked onto the balance staff with this collar right here. And then after that collar, you're staking on the hairspring with the collet here. And if it says F is hairspring collet, um, and then this hairspring is of, of various types of hairsprings, but but the expectation is the hairspring is is basically um, going out in an outward direction in a spiral direction, um, and the distance between each of the each of the uh, leaves of metal or whatever on the hairspring is the same all the way all the way through as it spirals around, right? So so assuming the watch has got the right hairspring on it, which means it's got the right length. It's got the right strength. It's got the right uh, uh, shape. Um, everything is right on the hairspring. So what could go wrong with a hairspring? So 
let me get my uh, my piece of paper out all right here's the infamous hairspring so my favorite thing to work on is hairsprings false <laughs> the worst thing to work on is hairsprings they're no fun at all so and I'm not going to talk tell talk to you today about about uh, the problems like how to adjust the hairspring and everything but as you look at this hairspring and you see the hairspring actually attached to the collet at this point in time if for example if this hairspring that's pinned into this collet has been pinned high or low then the hairspring plane will be sideways right so it'll, it won't be flat and I'll tell you what the problems are later with that but as the hairspring coils around like this the distances here uh, between each one of the coils should be exactly the same until it's until you get the bend as it goes out towards the the regulator pins and then the stud so and and you can see when you turn an escapement upside down you see I just happen to have one here look at that when you turn the uh, the I didn't say I said escapement I meant I meant the uh, the balance I'll call it the balance bridge today so we can keep it PG so when you turn the balance bridge around and the the hairspring is resting there on it right so can I find like something round here like a coin I'll use this thing here so let's just pretend let's pretend this is round okay I'm gonna pretend this is round so if this is off to the left or right rather and it's or it's off to the left or it's up or down it's not absolutely centered when it's just the the colleted hairspring right so it's colleted and it's studded and the stud is attached to the balance bridge this hairspring should be absolutely in the center so if you look down the uh, the collet here um, you would actually see the upper jewel so this these two things would be exactly centered so this would be like that so if this is not like th like this with this sitting in the center then you have to adjust this hairspring and move it so the whole thing kind of rests and it's centered right the other thing is if you if this roller table sorry if the hairspring call it is too is it, it's staked on and it's too far uh, to the right or too far to the left right then then the pin gets pretty complex man it gets pretty complex then the I gotta be able to flip pictures faster right flip pictures faster folks there you go so if it's left or right I think it's this picture that's best illustrates it the hairspring would be on the other side spinning like this on the other side and at rest if you took if you took all of this stuff out like take the pallet fork out and the hairspring is studded right and it's in it's studded to the balance bridge then this thing at rest would be absolutely in the center of these banking pins so the, a line drawn from the center of the balance staff um, all the way through to the center of the escapement wheel would be a, an absolute straight line so all of this would be a straight line and then and then so given that is is the situation when the pallet fork pushes the impulse jewel this way and the, the balance swings one way and say stops here when it swings the other way right with the other side going around it stops here at exactly the right position here and here and that means the ba the balance has been staked the mainspring that we have here has been staked on to the to the uh, balance staff at exactly the right position so those those things are all aligned those uh, three points are aligned as I said earlier so hopefully you got that uh, if you didn't then uh, Jesus I don't know how to explain it so anyway you can read about that um, and I actually did it on one of my videos a couple of videos back when I was uh, correcting the bead error so you have you're gonna have a bead error where, where the balance will swing further one way than it does the other way um, the bead error matters if your amplitude isn't strong. If your amplitude is strong, it doesn't matter as much, but it's nice to have a really good bead error. So you can't sleep at night without a good bead error. I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you. All right. So now we're going to look at the hairspring again. And so the other problems you can have with the hairspring, I just did a, a recording and it didn't record, which is kind of pisses me off. But 
that happens sometimes. So what I do is I take the hairspring, right, and I've got this school tool that I have, and I'll basically hold it with this tool here, and I've got a needle and a pin vise, right, and I hold the hairspring in the center like that, and then I take that hairspring, um, and I will press the hairspring on the side like this, right? Now, if that hairspring sticks together, there's, there's a few things it could be. It could be dirt, like a leftover oil that hit the hairspring combined with dust that could stick that together, or it could be magnetized. So if it's dirt that has stuck that together, and I had a situation where that happened and I could only see it under a microscope because I tried to clean it once, I put it in, in lighter fluid, um, I didn't leave it long enough and I pulled it out and thought it was fixed the problem and it didn't fix it at all. So what I did was I take a little, a little look, this is a, the end of a pipe, pipe stop, I think. So I filled that with lighter fluid through the hairspring in there, left it for half an hour. When I took that out, I looked under my stereo microscope and the hairspring was impeccably clean and all was good. So that was that problem. So yesterday I was fixing that 15 joule uh, Elgin pocket watch and I pressed on the hairspring and it was still attached to the balance staff, I believe. I had it all attached. It was attached to the balance. Um, and I pushed on it and it stuck together. So I said, oh, I'll just demagnetize that. So the first demagnetizing I did is I stuck it in my, let me just grab this for a second. This is my very scary vintage demagnetizer. And this is the one where I press the button and close my eyes because I'm going to get electrocuted. <laughs> so to think this thing is from the 40s or something, I glued the piece of paper back on. That's supposed to present, prevent electricity from coming through and killing you, a little piece of paper. So anyway, so I took this like this, I put the balance in like flat like that, press the button, and then as, I, as the button was pressed and it was on, I moved the balance out from the center of this, and I kept it absolutely in the center, moved it away, and it did not demagnetize the hairspring. All, it created a greater magnetic force on the hairspring, so it didn't work on the hairspring. So this kind of sucked. So I went to plan B, and because I've got a lot of these different demagnetizers, I took this demagnetizer and I put the balance on flat like this, and then I pressed the button and I raised it up two feet beyond as I slowly moved it up. It's supposed to demagnetize it. It didn't work. So what I ended up doing was taking the, the hairspring, the balance with the hairspring holding it, and holding it like this sideways on the edge turning this on and moving it up slowly and that did work so based on how this ella chinese demagnetizer works and where the coils are here by holding it sideways like that and raising it up it actually perfectly demagnetized that hairspring so once i i did that i took the the hairspring again and i just i pinned it there was already in there pinned but i but i took the hairspring and i touched it with my tweezers and these are non-magnetic brass tweezers and it didn't stick together I'm like perfect man and the result of that right and I'll show you this the result of that was was this beautifully running uh, watch with the hairspring uh, compressing and decompressing at uh, perfect rate with the the uh, the various the, the the leaves or whatever you want to call it of the hairspring are, are re remaining uh, the exact distance as it compresses or, decom or, or decompresses, right? So it's a perfectly, perfectly running hairspring. So, so demagnetizing the hairspring is absolutely essential. Um, making sure it's clean first, throw it in lighter fluid, leave it for like half an hour so you can get it all degunked. Take a, an agitator like this, right? Put that in there with the hairspring very carefully. Don't touch the hairspring and just get bubbles in there so it just moves the dirt and stuff. And as you take the hairspring out, you hold the stud with your tweezers like that, lift it out slowly and then shake it a bit as you're lifting it out and then lift it out and let it dry on a piece of watchmaking paper, right? So that's how you deal with the hairspring. And as I said earlier, there could be other issues with the hairspring. One of the other issues that you can have is that the as this goes through and you're going through the regulator pins, the hairspring should be in the exact center of the regulator pins. If the regulator pins are too tight, it's going to squeeze the hairspring. As, the, as you adjust the watch, right, as you adjust this movement here by moving the regulator arm left or right, it moves, if this moves left, this moves right. So if it's moving clockwise along the hairspring here, it's, it's virtually shortening the hairspring, which is speeding up the watch. And if you move it this way, it's virtually uh, lengthening the hairspring, which is slowing down the watch. But if these things are pinching it, it's not gonna work properly. 
so you have to make sure there's a right gap in there or if the hairspring itself is not in the right position as I said earlier uh, when, when in resting motion it's to the center of this of the balance bridge right then you could have the hairspring actually touching one side and never releasing from that side or touching the other side and never releasing and it should be exact center and then touching both sides as it compresses and decompresses so you have to check for that otherwise your your watch will not uh, you won't be able to keep your watch in time properly so so that's another thing to check for for a hairspring to make sure all of that is working properly so that's pretty much it for hairsprings if it's bent or twisted or whatever that's a whole other thing and you did, you have to learn how to how to uh, f repair a hairspring if you can but it's very 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 detailed work and can be very very frustrating so but i want to talk about something where i have to draw a diagram so to explain this next thing all right time for my wonderful artistry so so you've got the hairspring here. I'm going to be doing a, a sideways view diagram. In my hands, I got to turn my hand sideways to draw here because of the camera angle. But let's say that this is the the balance like this, right? So that's the balance. And if the hairspring is colleted wrong, and there's the balance, I'll say the balance staff is going through like this, like that. And let's just pretend that's the roller table like this and the impulse jewel and then the balance goes down like that and then it's into the you know it's going into the jewel that's the lower part of the balance so there's the upper part of the balance like this right and then this is going into the pivot like this and then the upper jewel and on the top part of this thing right I can hear the garage door opening I think my wife's escaping so this is the hairspring so if the hairspring is not studded properly so let's just draw the stud so there's the stud right there is the stud stud like that there's the stud and if this not is not studded properly your hairspring could be at a bit of an angle let me see if I can draw this I'm going to exaggerate the angle it could end up like like that that's pretty exaggerated so I've had this happen before and the the bridge say the bridge is here like this I should draw the bridge in, in black but say the bridge is like that right and the hairspring would go around and then attach itself like that so so when that happens when this particular situation happens um, what happens is that the hairspring uh, I'll do this again I'll draw the balance like this so here's here's the balance right you're staying with me right don't lie so there's the balance right from the top there's say I'll draw the bridge so there's the balance bridge the infamous balance bridge like this and I'll just make go like this so there's the balance bridge like that and let's just say this is the, the arm of the balance so there's an arm like this and then there's an arm on the other side right that's attached to the balance and the balance has you know screws on it right like that and the hairspring then is this hairspring here is going around in a circle so I'm going to see if I can draw that right so there's the hairspring coming out there and then coming back and then I'm exaggerating again but there's the hairspring coming out and then back and then and it doesn't go beyond the dimension of the balance so it's like that and when this is now at an angle because it was either studded improperly or when you put it back on the balance or when you staked it back onto the balance staff for some reason you touch that hairspring at the stud um, and it bent that way or it's so it's at an angle for some reason that is going to touch the arm right here right that's going to touch that arm right there you need to touch the arm color do i have a touch the arm color i do there's a touch the arm color so it's going to touch the arm there or it's going to touch the arm shitty markers touch the arm here so when it swings back and forth um, it's touching the actual arm of the balance right and if it touches the arm of the balance you're screwed so that hairspring will not operate it will not constrict or, or contract and then 
and then expand like this if it's touching that. So it'll slow that down and almost stop it. I've had watches that I've repaired and I've looked at the balance sideways, right, very closely, and I saw it was just barely touching. And what you had to do is, is start, is go right at the collet. It's usually not caused um, by the studding on the other on the, the stud on the other side, although it can be. Um, I'll explain that one in a second. But if it's at the collet here, then the whole thing is riding at an angle, like five degrees, and it's touching the arm. Then you actually have to fix that problem at the collet, right? So when you can do that, you can take the balance with hairspring off of the off the balance ta or the uh, the balance bridge. Take the whole balance complete off the balance bridge and, and then adjust that collet like adjust the hairspring on the collet with it on the balance so you can do that and make sure it's flat all the way around and then reinstall it um, or you can take the hairspring completely off and you can stick it on there's devices you can put it on but you can ride the hairspring on the needle like this and then adjust that so it's flat and then take the collet and then restake it onto the balance staff and that'll fix that problem um, the other thing uh, that I had the other day was, was just a bit different. Um, the hairspring was, this, there was a stud on the, on the balance cock or the balance bridge. And as the hairspring came around, it was studded. And then there was regulator pins coming out like this. And when, it, when I studded it back on to this here, because normally you just screw it in to the balance uh, bridge, this actually had a stud and it was in that fake Swiss watch I was repairing. And so when I put the, the very small piece of brass pin and I pinned it back in, this was pinned at an angle so that the pin, can I explain that with a, yet another diagram here? Diagram center, so, so there's the pin, there's the stud like that, right? And the pin, the end of the hairspring was, was here like this, like that, and the other side was on this side, and then I placed a pin in the hair in the stud to keep this in place, and this goes off off around to the corner, right? It goes to the grocery store and back. But when I pinned it like this, I put the pin in like that, and the pin was at a bit of an angle like this, and that caused this to go down and this to go up, and so when the hairspring went around from the its, its pinned and studded position on the balance bridge and went around through the regulator pins, it was already at an angle pushing it downward. And it pushed it downward to the point where it was touching the, uh, the arm of the balance. So that was something that I had to fix at the, uh, at the, pin, at the stud here. So, so hairsprings can be a mess. So now I've, there's tons of stuff to cover on a pocket watch and why it would not break, be good or whatever. But I've covered most of this, I think. So I'm just going to go through the book really quickly and see if I've missed anything. So I've covered the loose dials, loose out of position. I haven't discussed how to replace the uh, dial feet, but you could have a broken dial foot and need to replace that. Broken or bent hour wheel, teeth or pipe, um, bro and, and how to, that has to be replaced. Broken or bent minute wheel. Uh, or the leaves of the pinion with crap in them. I've discussed that. Uh, broken or bent uh, cannon pinion leaves or pipe. So if the cannon pinion is too loose, then you have to use your staking set to tighten the cannon pinion. Um, if it's too tight as well, um, you won't be able to set the time on the watch. So you have to remove that cannon pinion and get another one. I don't know if you can loosen a cannon pinion, but you can tighten it. So, so someone again can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, then bent or broken balance staff, I discussed that one already because you could have the balance staff with the pivots that are broken and you need to replace uh, the balance staff itself and get some nice pivots in there and make sure they're burnished and they're the right shape and all of the rest of that. So that, that's another problem you can have with a watch um, and that's usually due to impact. Um, there's a thing on polishing the pivots here, how to polish pivots, I've got videos on that. Uh, friction jeweling, so I've discussed cracked jewels and putting the jewel in the, in the correct place. Uh, just a quick note on jeweling then. When you're putting a jewel in, let me just grab that other diagram I had before if I can find it. Um, there it is there. 
So when you're when you're putting the jewel back in, whether it's here or whether it's in the plate, the the actual distance that this jewel goes into the plate or into the setting is so important. So if this is too low, then it's going to rub on the balance uh, on the balance staff here, and then the balance could stop, slow down, or stop. If it's too high, then it's not going to touch the top for the cap, and it's going to rattle around, and your balance will be shaking up and down. Which, is, which will cause the other uh, problem. So it has to be the exact right uh, level. And the best way to do that is to measure the level it was before you replace it and then replace it back at the exact same level. And that's a whole other discussion, but that can cause the problem as well. Um, and usually in, in pocket watches, you're not doing friction jeweling. You're doing that in watches with a seized jeweling set. You're burnishing in jewels and other things, but if you have to do friction jeweling, you have to make sure the old jewel was put in at the exact same depth as the new jewel, or the old, new jewel is put in the same depth as the old jewel. So you have the the depth between plates is is the same. And there's tools for measuring that, right? Bent or broken hairspring. Well, that's pretty obvious. You've got to replace the hairspring. Uh, cracked or chipped or broken balance jewels. I described that. Ch the loose pallet jewels. Describe that. Lower roller jewel. Um, I did talk about the uh, roller table jewel or the impulse jewel, and that has to be if it's not tight or whatever, you have to re shellac it in, or if it's broken, uh, you have to replace it. Um, uh, the pallet, bent or broken pallet arbor pivots, pretty obvious you need to replace those. Um, go back up here. So, your guard pin I described that's on the back of the pallet fork there, the mouth part of the pallet fork. That guard pin has got to work absolutely perfect as it goes into the uh, into the watch. Um, a quick two-second drawing on that one. I'm reusing paper, so too bad. I don't, don't want any comments on it. So, as the guard pin uh, goes in, so you get the roller tables on top, and then you get this table here, and then there's a little U like that. And let's say that's the pallet fork here, like that, and it's on the top part like that and then there's a guard pin that goes in here like that so the guard pin either goes in that way or goes in from the top but this guard pin prevents the overbanking of the uh, of the watch which means that the, the impulse jewel goes over on this side the pallet fork can't go the other way and then when it comes back it won't slam onto the side of the pallet fork and so if the fork is the mouth is like that it's a shitty mouth and your impulse jewel ends up on this side as it's swinging around this way it's just going to hit this and not enter the mouth of the pallet fork and then you're screwed so so that can happen if if the guard pin is bro not there broken or bent if it's bent a bit it's not going to go in and out of this slot perfectly and that's what you want for this guard pin you want it th this to spin around and catch that fork and the guard pin goes in perfectly and it comes out it can't do this if your guard pin is working properly so you may have to replace uh, repair bend uh, whatever the guard pin so that could be a problem with the pocket watch and the guard pin so so that's some guard pin discussion there and talked about that. Uh, broken or bent banking pins. Uh, so I talked about the banking pins and if they're broken or bent, they gotta be replaced and they have to have proper banking on both sides. Um, basically the pallet fork will sit there at rest and the banking pins will be on either side when the impulse jewel is in the center, right? So your banking pin should be absolutely true that way. So escape worn, escape wheel teeth, I talked about that. You basically need a new escape wheel. You can't replace those teeth. Um, train wheel, jewels and bearings, I talked about those. Just going through everything here, man. Uh, broken bent chain and pivot leaves, talked about that. Broken bent wheel and teeth, uh, mainspring, broken or bent mainspring barrel teeth. So you can actually replace those barrel teeth. It's not easy, but you can do it. So be broken teeth means that you don't have that gear train completely um, working because there's a tooth missing and it won't pass the energy on to the next gear because that tooth will, will stop. Dirt in the movement is pretty obvious. Um, and if you've got, another thing too, is if you've got the main spring here and, and the arbor, so the, the spring goes around in a circle like that, right? And I don't have a main spring on me, but, but if that arbor... It's time for another di diagram. Woohoo! So if you've got, so there's your, let's make a big picture of the arbor. There's the arbor like that. And then this will go down a bit like this. And then it'll go over and then there'll be a, a pin that's at an angle like that. 
and then it goes back over like this. So that's an exaggeration. But the mainspring will go will will go in like this and catch this this arbor. I need a mainspring color, right? Mainspring color a coming. So it'll catch this arbor on the way through and then it'll start winding around like this. That's the mainspring. Not the hairspring, the mainspring. So if this if this is not, the first wind is really tight. I made it loose, but it's actually really tight. The first wind coming around is really tight, and then it goes up. If this is <coughs> loose, and you wind up the, the uh, mainspring on here, it may wind the first time. The second time, the mainspring, the, the, the hook that's hooking on to the mainspring um, may let go, and then this whole thing will slip, right? So your mainspring might slip. So it might still be a good mainspring, but it's slipping and so you can't get power to the watch. So the way you do that is you, you, you basically have to squeeze this circle tighter so that the mainspring grabs onto the center arbor. Um, uh, it's, it grabs onto the center arbor harder, which, which makes this hole better. The other thing too is if it's really old and this, this little this, uh, jobby doohick, you have to say that word once, if this, if this uh, notch that's in the arbor is worn out, you may have to file a new notch so that it catches the mainspring, right? So that could be a problem. And then on the barrel of the mainspring, you can have the barrel on the outside, draw an outside barrel. So there's the outside of the mainspring like that. And you can have a hook on the barrel like this that catches the mainspring. I'm gonna go reverse colors on you to screw you up. And then the mainspring comes around. I put a mainspring in the other day that had a T opening like that. And the mainspring comes around like this it hooks onto this hook and then it keeps going around in a circle, right? And then it goes around and around and around and until it gets to the arbor and it's got to be tight around that arbor and then hooked on the arbor right there, right there. So if that's the arbor in the middle, I'm reversing colors on you. Uh, then the arbor would be right here and it's hooked on right there. And that hook has, has to be good so you could examine that, make sure the hook is there, make sure the mainspring, the hole in the mainspring that hooks on usually looks like this and then there's usually an opening sometimes it's square and sometimes it's domed at the end or round at the end and it looks like that and then sometimes you've got that hook like this and then later on you've got a little bit of a T thing happening for some types of mainsprings like that and the T goes oop I screwed up my diagram the T goes in through a hole in the barrel on the top and a hole in the barrel on the bottom uh, and I had one yesterday that had the, ho the hole the hook and the hole so if you have this hook broken, right, it's broken off completely and you need that hook, then you can fashion a new hook by, by going through the barrel with a piece of metal, I'll say, um, and then you shave this off and you end up with another hook. So there's a way of repairing that. So your mainspring, the spring itself could be perfect, but your barrel could be screwed up on the inside by that hook being either worn out or broken and you need to replace that hook or your arbor having a problem with the hook on the arbor. Um, and, and make sure you put enough lubrication on the top and bottom of that arbor so that so it moves freely within that barrel. So that could also be the issue, right? So you need to keep an eyeball on that. So the book also goes into other things like the, the uh, crown on screws, right? And basically you can re-screw the crown in onto the stem and put some Loctite on it or the stem pulls out completely and that's another thing because it's not hooking in properly when you put the watch together on Swiss watches there's a screw that you tighten and if you don't tighten that enough then it won't hook onto the stem and you can pull the whole thing right out again um, which is not not favorable on old American pocket watches these stems are fixed to the crown and there's a sleeve in there and then there's adjusters that you can adjust that sleeve by rotating it left or right so that's the proper distance as it goes in and out of the movement that's in there so so that's you know, worn out things in there. Uh, the watch can be wound but not set. I talked about that earlier of not having those screws in there where the, where the setting wheel and those sorts of things are. Uh, I think I talked about the ratchet wheel, whatever that's called. Let me look at that. No, not there. I gotta get my book in the right order here. That yeah, was this here. So this, yeah, so it's not setting properly so something's not right here and I did talk about that uh, the dial washer, I think it's called. I might have called it something else, but there's a dial washer that goes, I called it the dial leaf spring or leaf something or other. But anyway, there's a dial washer that goes on here that pushes this hour 
wheel down and keeps it in position so the gears are inter intermeshing with the pinion on the minute wheel. So things like that. Um, and you can test that so you got to make sure the parts are not worn or broken or screws are not on. Uh, it'll set but not whine. Well, there's all kinds of stuff there. Broken mainsprings, blah, yada, da, di, da, di. Uh, watch will not whine or set. Watch is hard to set. Watch is hard to whine. I've talked about most of this stuff. The stem is slipping, is stem slipping and setting position. Improper depth of the sleeve in the pennant. I talked about that a few seconds ago. So the sleeve depth is not right here and you gotta fix that. Um, watch does not wind tight, whatever that means. Uh, yeah, let's say the mainspring is slipping off the arbor. I already just talked about that. Uh, this is the cannon pinion and tightening the cannon pinion so it has enough friction that when you turn it, it turns without, the way the cannon pinion actually works is that the, the cannon pinion will turn when you're setting the watch and it'll slide on the pivot of the center wheel but there's enough friction on there but when the watch is running the center wheel grabs this as this pinion and actually and actually moves it so that's how that kind of works so you have to have a cannon pinion that's just tight enough right so so that's that one there um, and then watch will not will run for only a few hours so it's usually broken teeth stuff I'm not sure what it says here but uh, da, 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 da. Yeah. Oh, that's the mainspring is not good enough. It might be set. So if the mainspring has been in there for a billion years, it's squeezed in and it's set. So it won't hold power, won't give power to the watch if it's called set, right? So that's why I replaced that mainspring on that 15 joule uh, Elgin watch. Uh, gains time, loses time. I've talked about some of that stuff. Um, uh, watch will not indicate proper time. I've talked about that. Blah, blah, blah. Watch band is broken. Oh, big deal. Magnetism. So I chatted about magnetism and what that causes. Um, also, you got to make sure your balance is true to flat and true to round. So use these calipers to, to do that. Uh, and I did a video on that too. You can look that up on how to do that. It was, it was pretty popular. And then magnetism uh, causes all kinds of crap to happen, but it's mainly with the with the hairspring. I mean, but magnetism on the other wheels can be transferred to the hairspring, so you got to demagnetize the, the watch when you're doing repair on it. Uh, the balance is untrue. We talked about that. It's nice to be true. I'm true. True is a song that I used to listen to when I was a kid. Uh, I can't remember who played it, but it was a pretty good song called True. Anyway, this is balancing it to true to flat and true to round. The balance is true to untrued around that'll cause all kinds of inconsistencies in the timing plus it might scrape along stuff uh, poising the balances in here as well how to poise the balance and how to do that troubleshooting that um, hairspring issues we talked about hairspring issues at nauseum so all of the things that could possibly go wrong with the hairspring there it is there setting up the escapement uh, timing the watch so this is all about timing the watch so so, and also the timing signals, and you can actually tell if the watch has got a problem, if the timing is running, if it's running fast or it's running slow, and if you've got signals it's going tick, 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 then your beat error is not good if these are too far apart. If they're nice, nice and tight together, then you've got a decent beat error for the watch. And I discussed beat error earlier. Um, and if it's going in one direction or the other, it's slow or fast. So it depends on what timing machine you have. But I look at the consistencies of the beats right so that you get consistent beats plus the distance between the lines for the for the tick and the talk so you can tell with it, whether the beat error is uh, right or wrong uh, plus any waveform you might get in in this here that might determine whether there's a problem with uh, with one of your wheels or or something like that right so and this book actually has some pennant down pennant left pennant up because there's positional errors you can get and that's usually based on the jewels being worn or, or or there's pivot problems on the wheels on one side but not on the other and and so you can have those problems you can have erratic issues like that on the watch um, and the watch stops all kinds of ziggy zag things that will you know minute minute the uh, second wheel friction problems and all this stuff so but it's, it gets pretty in depth of different problems you could have and you can detect with this as well so so basically um, that I think my friends is enough on this on diagnosing a watch and things to do about it 
I'm just going to look at this watch for a second and think if there's anything else that I think could be an issue on this thing right now as I look at it. I have made parts for pocket watches for uh, quite a few years. Um, I've re I've repivoted wheels before. Um, that's not that's not that bad, but still tricky to do. Uh, I think of all the problems I've had, I think problems with the balance, the dirt, and the hairspring have been the worst problems to have. Um, I've made quite a few balance staffs, um, and I think in some cases I'd rather make a new balance staff to fix it than than try to adjust an existing balance staff. I know they write things about uh, about actually you know fixing a bent pivot on a balance staff, but you know you're better off putting a brand new balance staff in there or making one and putting it in. So. So when you're, uh, you know, you can over lubricate a watch too. If you put too much lube in the watch, um, then the watch somehow collects dust over time and that dust attaches to the lubrication and the whole thing causes friction, which will slow down and maybe stop your watch. So, so when you're reassembling a watch, just make sure all the screws are, are tight. They don't have to be so tight that the next guy can't remove them. Just make sure they're tight enough to, uh, to, to hold everything in place. Uh, back in the day they didn't have things like Loctite and stuff but I don't recommend using that anyway. It's not really necessary. Um, and jeweling is interesting because you have to have the right jewel size, the right hole size for the jewel and the right depth of the jewel up and down so that everything works perfectly again. So, And, and you can use the J-Cot tools and stuff to burnish your pivots on these to actually make them nice and smooth if the pivots have been roughed up by a broken jewel. So you can do that, um, and in general, uh, make sure making sure your hands are in properly. Uh, and when you put the hands in position, I got some better hand putter inners. Uh, but when you put the hands in position, they're absolutely flat down like this, and they're not rocking left or right. So the so when you're putting it down, the hand is not actually slanted to the left or to the right, and that it's the right height going up and down. So. Um, so that, I think, is it for today's talk on diagnosing watch problems. Um, if I missed anything, you can let me know. Uh, it's, I, don't, I didn't really talk about the case and stuff, but just the movement itself. Um, and I can't really think of anything else I want to talk about, so I think we, everything is probably covered in general. So that's a general discussion on diagnosing watch problems. Alrighty then, that was my talk today on diagnosing watch problems. As I said earlier, you start from the power going inward and just you can listen to my video and maybe get some tips and hints on how to figure out what the problem would be with your watch or your pocket watch. Um, be very careful when you're working on watches. Be very calm when you're working on watches. Make sure that you don't get all intense, and especially when you're working on hairsprings, when you get to super frustrated because your hairspring's not reacting the way it should react, I need a drink of coffee. Then you've got to ba basically make sure that uh, you're not all peeved off when you're working on a hairspring because it can cause, hold on, hold on, it can cause you all kinds of trauma working on hairsprings. Um, this book I have here that's uh, the Ordnance Maintenance Manual from the U.S. Military War Department it's an excellent book on diagnosing watch issues, right? So, and really practice, uh, practice will give you uh, a lot of uh, experience, basically. So you just keep doing it and you'll find new things and new things. Like, for example, when I described uh, demagnetizing that hairspring um, uh, yesterday, I think is when I did that, and holding it this way and moving it up from that magnet demagnetizing device, um, that worked and the other things didn't work. So. Uh, I'm not sure what your experience is, but that was uh, pretty cool. So this this book itself has run through all kinds of stuff. I think if you look on eBay, you can probably find a copy of this book. Uh, TM9-1575. If you're an Army watch guy, this was your baba. So your baba. So um, anyway, that was a great talk on, uh, I think, diagnosing watches. I just kind of went through a lot of crap really fast. So hopefully you enjoy it. Um, and uh, I didn't go through all the tools and stuff, but uh, pocket watches um, are a machine and they've got to be maintained properly. Um, and when you disassemble and you reassemble the machine, it should be done to spec. So replacing a jewel and making sure it's the right depth in the plate is critical. You might not think it is, but it absolutely is. So 
So you really have to take your time with every problem on a pocket watch to bring it back to life perfectly. Um, if you do that, you'll end up with a like new pocket watch that's maybe 100 years old and bring it back to its original condition, which is really cool. Anyway, so thanks for watching this video today. Um, a shout out to Bori who said, you got to make another video, man. You got to make another video. Um, I got a little bit of a lighting thing happening here. I wonder if this works. If I turn this light on, do I, do I get brighter? Wham, look at that, I get brighter. So does everything else. <laughs> so, so anyway, so that's uh, good. Uh, give me a call or not call. Give me a, ta a line on uh, watch, JD, uh, watch service at gmail.com or give me some comments online um, and let me know if you learned anything here. Uh, if you didn't, just don't watch the video, okay? It's your choice. You can turn it off anytime. I don't bother putting music in the videos because you want music, you just start a music video. Gall darn it. <laughs> uh, I said jobby doohickey, I think, twice in this video. Um, and I guess I just said it again, so that's three times. Jobby doohickey, four. Make a clean four. Anyway, have fun repairing your watches. Uh, good luck and stay safe. And thanks for watching and please subscribe to my channel and share it with friends.